Hey guys, welcome back. This is Code Red Rules, and today we're going to be playing some 25 No Limit on Full Tilt Poker. And as you can see, we've got four tables up and running, and I plan on having four tables up the entire time. I've said in pre uh, previous times I'm just going to do a 2 to 1 ratio of two tables to four tables. I know there's people that like me only to do two tables, but there's also people that want me to do four, and so I kind of have to do both. Uh, honestly, I prefer to do two, but. Uh, Ask and you guys shall receive, and you guys will get at least get a, a couple two, four tabling videos out of me, so we can get ourselves some good action going. Uh, I haven't been playing too long; just sat down maybe about an orbit ago, so I've just had enough time to organize my HUD stats here. Hopefully, it doesn't look too confusing for you all, and if you if you if it does, then maybe I'll avoid doing full tilt videos in the future. But I it feels like I've, it's been so long since I've done it a full tilt video that I'll have decided to go ahead and do this here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and fold both these. If they were both folded around to me, I probably would still fold the King Jack suited over here, number four, and number three, I would have blind stolen it up with the Queen two suited. Uh, I'm going to try, I'll probably be avoiding doing anything uh, too big of um, commentary wise as I expect to get a lot of action because full tilt hands uh, are dealt more uh, per table hour than they are on stars, if I remember correctly. So, alright, we don't have a read on this opponent, and I think I'm going to go ahead and open it up. We're going to, he made it 3x, so we're going to make it 10, so 10 times 20 is going to be 250. I made it 258 for some reason, but that'll work. Um, if I actually had more of a read on him, that maybe he wouldn't call my re-raise to semi light, like with ace queen, then I probably wouldn't make the re-raise there, and I would just flat it behind. Right now, I'm either going to be ahead. I don't think he's going to fold a pair. He, if he if he has ace queen, I'm going to be uh, be maybe winning in here. This bet could be just about anything. So, like I like I re-raise pre-flop one, and I take it down a whole lot. Two, uh, he does call me with hands like ace queen. Um, that I will get a lot of value of when I when I do hit uh, the ace or the king. And uh, three, I am in position, so I get to play better. Now, if we were if it was just one open raise, then I could see myself calling it. And if it was like maybe one position over, I would, I would call it too. I mean, I actually don't hate a call there. And uh, but against an unknown player right now. I'm going to re-raise it up, and especially at these lower limits, I'm going to expect to get played back at by worse. Now, if it were a, a mid-stakes game, if I were playing 100 or 200, 200 specifically, if I didn't know the opponent, then I probably wouldn't re-raise there. But since this is a different level, I'm going to go ahead and assume that these guys are actually going to call me a little bit lighter until I get known otherwise. So, uh, as you can see, I'm not using the bet pot button on this site. And it's not just because that I play more most on stars and so keep my bets the same. Uh, it's just that I really hate the pot, the bet pot button. Uh, I hate it with a passion. I think it makes players lazy, and um, it, especially for for players trying to learn the game, they they just sit there and they don't under they don't even like attempt to understand why to do a certain bet here and there. You know, you just bet the you just push the bet pot button. And and go on your way. And I really don't like bet or pot bet raises preflop, whether that's out of position or as a re-raise or just as a as a raise in, in general. So I'm not a big fan of the bet pot button. Now and there are several people out there that have like betting scripts, and I feel the same way about a betting a bet pot script as I do about the bet pot button. You know, when you start running scripts and stuff, you you really just standardize your play, and you don't actually force yourself to make a decision, and you don't actually get better, any better at poker until you sit down and, and actually think about the decisions that you're making. Sure, anybody can just go like Autobot pilot, or not anybody, but a monkey could play this game if you give him a, a correct set of circumstances to do it under. You know, a bot could do the same thing. You don't really want to be a bot if you're trying to improve as a player you want to be able to adjust and think about why you're doing something and scripts specifically like bet pot scripts I'm not a huge fan of 
Uh, I've actually I've used them in the, in the past. Uh, when I first started playing No Limit, switching from Limit Hold'em, uh, when I was I was massively able to play it, tabling the uh, six max games here on Stars. And excuse me for my pause. My bunny just got into something, and I don't know what it was. As she made a really loud noise, but I will continue. Those who, those who follow me know that I have I have a, I recently received I got a pet bunny, and she's a little mischief maker. But okay, on to what I was saying is. You know, I used a bet pot script, and it worked out for me for quite a while until my players started to adjust to me. And using the bet pot script, I was not actually able to adjust to them back again because I was so focused, uh, or I was just so I, I used the the bet pot button as as a, as a as a crutch. And when you develop a crutch, it's kind of like developing, you know, starting smoking. Okay, uh, we don't really have any reads on this opponent. We had an over pair, so we're going to go ahead and bet it out. Um, if he raises us, we'll probably end up calling once and then folding the turn. Because we really don't know what he's going to have. So he could be putting, he could be pure bluffing us. As long as he's calling us, though, I'm feeling like he's going to have a hand like queens, or he's going to have, he might be a fish and I have a, like ace ten or something. So I'm not going to bet very big. I'm going to keep betting small. I still think I can get some value here. Like at mid-stakes games, I see a qu I see the queen here, queens here a whole lot. But I'm going to go ahead and bet small. Hopefully, I can entice a small weaker pair to call. A lot of players there would keep betting big, big, big. Um, he was a pretty weak player. He's kind of a kind of a fish. So. Uh, Make a note on him. I don't really use the color codes. I'm not too familiar with them. However, uh, if you do play this game, you should certainly use the color codes. As they're a very big, very, very big help. Okay, three-two offsuit is probably the worst possible hand and hold and play heads up. So we're gonna fold it and, and to fold that. But even though I don't use color codes too much, I will use the note. So, and the thing is, we can go back to that uh, hand here. Notice our bet sizing on each street. Uh, you can go go ahead and rewind rewind the video if you want. We uh, or pause it and go backwards. We we the I pretty much bet like I think I bet two thirds on the flop, but then bet half pot on the turn on the river. I I bet like 125 into 175 on the flop, which is roughly two thirds, and then the pot on the turn was 250 plus 175, which is like four and a quarter. So I bet two like uh, well not necessarily half pot, but like a little under uh, three quarter or two thirds, and then on the river it was like half pot. I mean, granted, I the thing was with this hand jacks on the 10 high board against the unknown, I don't expect to get my stack in, and so I have to put plan my bets accordingly. All right, uh, we're playing against a relatively tight opponent. He could have any, he's going to have actually offsuit broadways here a whole lot, so I'm going to check it back and maybe induce a bluff out of him on this turn. Oh, he might, he will probably be bluffing me with hands like ace ten and ace jack that will have me beat, but I think he's also going to have a hand like uh, king king queen queen jack a heck of a lot that he's going to ping one out there. And I think I'm going to be ahead here a whole lot. Or he just has an ace king, which is just fine by me. I don't think he's gonna fold that flop. Um, he might fold the flop, but to be honest, we think I think we have a strong enough hand there that we can certainly check it back. And we're gonna make a note that uh, that's a very big, a very big key note. Because that way I know if that if he's ever re-raising me. Yeah, you know, I'm probably just gonna go. I want to go. I'm not really too worried about it. Cause if 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 you're ever gonna be re-raising a hand pre-flop for value, especially out of position, it probably should be ace king. Be granted, yeah. I mean, obviously, ace ace outside of like aces and kings, but that, that's usually a very standard re-raise, especially against someone who's been kind of as aggressive as I have been. Granted, I've only played eleven hands, but I am 
like roughly 25, 17 for those 12 hands. So I'm a very, I should be a very easy 3-bet target. So if he does 3-bet me, I'm actually going to play extremely tight versus him, and we're going to blind steal this guy to oblivion. We don't have any read on this guy, to be honest, but I'm going to blind steal him. Now I don't have to see bet that's where a lot of players go wrong. You know, they raise preflop, but then they have to assume they have to continuation bet. The reason why I'm not continuation bet here is because my my one my preflop raise alone is going to show profit, uh, just because he's going to be folding um, most of the time. Uh, and even when he does call me like he did here, I'm actually going to win. You know, maybe like even if I give up when I don't hit and I want to continue when I do hit, I'm still going to win. You know, maybe not a full third of the time when I hit my pair, but. Uh, at least probably 10 or 15 percent of the time. So, and that I mean that alone is make, make my my race Now, if I had a gut shot or something on that flop, I, I'm definitely going to be going with it. But, I mean, I don't even I don't even have a gut shot draw. Uh, this guy posted dead in the cutoff, so he's got really any two cards. So I'm not really going to give him any any strength or anything. And even if he does call me, I probably will be more lucky continuation about him. At least, like I said, he's got like any two cards there. So just because he calls, it doesn't mean we have to put a continuation bet out there. Uh, I, I think the deciding difference between me c betting and not c betting in that spot is the stack size, and that if I did make a bet, I could not get away. Um, and it would be annoying to bet fold. We're getting like five to one with complete error, um, so I, I wouldn't put myself in a situation where I would have to do that. And with like relatively little equity there, with an with only a nine. Let's see. Tonight is a Friday night, so the games should be should be going pretty going pretty good. I don't expect to see too many regs on. Although uh, I will say from personal experience, the games on full tilt are generally tighter than stars, which is probably the reason why the the, the hands are dealt faster. A lot of players that play on tilt actually have rake back, and they play on tilt because they because they get the rake back uh, in a cash form. I was one of the unlucky ones that four or five years ago sign up at full tilt um, before rake pack was really all that popular. It was just gaining popularity. Um, and the problem was I was playing limit hold'em too, which made it even worse. I went through and I got all the bonuses before I, and I didn't sign up for rake pack with the bonuses. So it really took away my some some potential later. Um, I still play on tilt when I get bonus opportunities and I will play on tilt for tournaments. I play uh, probably one or two, maybe three tournaments a week on Sundays on, on tilt. But in general, I, I am, for the past several years, I've just been a, a mainly stars opponent, stars player. Before that, I was a party player. So, yeah, I can go. I, my bunny got into something over there. She's munching on. She, she's been munching on the baseboards of my apartment. And it, then they're like the they kind of cover my entire apartment, so you know trying to get her to stop doing that has been uh, a pain in the butt. But she's still really nice to have around. Um, I'm pretty much ho home alone all day, so she's like a, a third roommate. Well, outside of my fiance, but and my fiance loves her, so that's that's actually the most important thing. When you're playing at full tilt, and I'm sure a lot of you guys who regulars are, uh, any any regular who does play full tilt, you're gonna notice these little circles up here, the Iron Man. Uh, that's kind of like the equivalent to like the Poker Stars VIP program. Personally, I have the VIP things off on Stars, where y you can notice like who is what level. Um, I also have it on so nobody can really see what level I am. But you know the guys that they had these little Iron Man things. It's kind of like a, a red flag showing that hey, I I play a lot of poker. I'm kind of a reg. I believe, although I have no idea what it takes to be a an Iron Man, but I really haven't seen anybody too fishy be one. Although it could possibly I'm not angry it could be one of those. Alright, so keep in mind here that Tan Tan Boss posted dead. 
And so if the play goes fold all the way around and then uh, it folds and it checks to me between me and the cutoff, I will most likely be raising it up in the big blind here. Uh, I could really steal this. I think I'm going to try and steal this. I'm going to bet it like a dollar. Make it a buck fifty. down. Uh, his play, uh, lifting in the button here is really weak. I don't even know if he like, even noticed Tan Tan like, uh, post dead, but over limps are probably the weakest form of, of calling there is, because they've already decided that they don't want to raise, and so it's like a hand that they, they want to play, but they don't want to play a big pot with, so that's why I, bumped it. I bump it up and and force them to play a big pot, even though I'm out of position. Even if when they do call me, I'm going to be able to see it and take it down half a lot. Plus, when I have a hand like uh, Queen Nine suited, like I did the last hand, it actually uh, it plays pretty well out of position in that spot. Like I don't have to feel committed with a hand like uh, top pair, and I also hit a decent enough nice flops that I can continue on. And it's also very well described. Like p players that see me raise there, they're probably thinking that I have a very strong hand, so like top five hand. Um, but when I wake up with a hand like queen nine there, and the board comes eight jack ten, a hand a board that relatively misses all those all those uh, bigger hands, then I wake up there with a nuts and I get paid off. Oh, that's that's very rare though. I'm not really I'm not saying that happens all the time. All right, I'm gonna be c betting this ace like it's going out of style. Don't have to bet too much, just because he's usually only going to call me right here with the ace or the flush draw. Um, you will get floated sometimes, but uh, to be honest, this c bet here is going to be wildly profitable, even though against someone who's um, going to be trying to play back at you because of our hand. We also need to protect the times we do have the ace. Um, if I were in position here and he checked me again, I might bet it. Being out of position, we put ourselves in a really crappy spot and uh, pretty much allow ourselves to get bluffed off our own hand. Because he's going to be checking back there on that turn with pretty much all of his value hands, too. Like, he, he might bluff the turn with the flush draw, but he also might check it back. Same thing goes for the river. He might check back the river on the flush draw. Uh, I'm going to call the min raise. So, I mean, you could go ahead and fire that barrel there. The only thing is, though, like if he actually had a hand there on the... Uh, that's a really good flop. If he had a hand there on the turn, or on the river, he wasn't going to fold it anyway. Uh, we pretty much have a lock in this hand, so I don't even think we're going to raise right now. I'm going to go ahead and call. And we get called out of position, so it's usually going to be a pocket pair, maybe like uh, ace, king of some kind. If he raises me, I'm going to be a little bit fishy. Okay. Now, if he bets weak here, I might have to raise. Okay, I don't really see him having, like... Queen Jack, part of the range. I need to build a pot. Like, I don't really see him having Queen Jack here a whole lot, so I'm going to keep betting. Um, if he pops me up, I probably will have to let it go. Now, you can argue, like, why didn't I raise that flop? And, uh, one, to be honest, I, I certainly could have. Um, I mean, with 4 to be blind effective stack, it could very easily be the best play. And I might have, you know, that could be a mistake by me not raising the flop. Uh, however, I have such a huge lock on the hand. Um, and the SPR is already like four, I believe. The pot was, what, like 250 going to the flop? He min raised it. Min raised it pre, we got three callers. Four callers. So the pot was like two and a quarter. Effective stack was around nine fifty ten dollars. I mean, I could very I could actually get it in fairly easily on later streets, which is why I I, I debated I waited to race to the turn in that spot. Because um, it, it min bets gets calls calls gonna be like three dollars. I can make it two dollars on the on the turn, and then the pot would be seven if called heads up, and then just get the rest in on the on the river with one river pot size bet left. So, like I said, I really didn't have to raise there. I had a, I had a pretty strong lock on the hand. Um, he is going to show up with a hand like Ace-King there a whole lot, and 
And I'm going to get stacked that way. I'm going to be a little aggro here and raise up Ace 2 suited. So, I mean, I'm going to get stacked with the Ace King, but for four to be blinds, I usually can afford it. He min raised preflop and he min bet two straight, so I really don't think he's going to have a hand like Ace King. Um, I also don't necessarily want to fold out the. Uh, the fish here, even though he's only got 10 big blinds. Um, opt most optimal play would be if Salmon min bets, I call, and Tony All-Star check raises all in for the rest of the deck, putting Salmon to decision with, if he has a hand like Ace-10 or something like that, it's going to be a... He's, kinda, he's not going to be able to fold it. And I'm obviously not folding that ever, uh, flop ever. And Even if I do raise, I'm going to get it in. Um, but to, to, to be honest, we don't have that much equity against our opponent if he has Ace-King. Um, you can run the poker show numbers uh, yourself. I, right now, I do not have. Uh, I know I'm going to be four tabling. Otherwise, I would do it for you. But we're looking at say like if we have ace queen suited here. We're, we've got like 11 outs, so we're roughly around 43, 44 percent equity. Now I know like a lot of six mix players would be like LOL raise, get it in, and full ring though is not necessarily uh, that 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 intelligent. Um, I mean, it's not going to be like that minus EV of a spot, and it's really just going to be high variance, given that there's enough money in the pot that it's going to be, uh, it is going to be like probably break even at worst. But I think calling there and inducing like worse hands to play, like if we raise there and get Ace Jack to fold, then we're making a mistake. And you know, with an Ace on the board, so if I had Ace Jack there and I got raised, there's probably a good chance I would let it go. Same thing goes if I had like any kind of Ace in that spot. So, you know, we don't actually have the most equity, so we don't want to get it in um, unless we certainly have to. Like, if he bets pot there, I probably would still would call. But, you know, if he, like, overshoved all in, then, yeah, I would call. But if I can avoid putting my stack in when I'm only, like, 40-something uh, odd percent equity, when I could actually wait and get it in, um, or, you know, induce bluffs for, on later streets, then I will most certainly do that, too. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, fold the king seven. I see a lot of players will just check fold this king two and number four, you know, auto check mark it. Don't want to be doing that either. You want to make sure that you don't give anything away when you don't have, when, you, when you're not running like massive a lot of tables. Like if I'm nine, 12 tables or something like that, then I might go ahead and put the auto check fold on here. Um, part of the reasons why you don't want to do check fold is that you don't want to make people think that you're just playing autopilot and playing on, uh, some kind of like standard level, and you want to make sure that you make it. A, you also want to give the impression that you're thinking about decisions too. Now he didn't make a min raise there, and if it were king ten suited, I probably would call. Being out of pos being in position though, I mean king two off suit, it's not really gonna flop a fair favorable hand all too much. And uh, this is a pretty easy. Like we we need at least something that's gonna be playable. Um, and king two offsuit isn't exactly that flare. I mean, there's a big difference between king two and ace two. And ace two is that um, you know when, when we we're gonna flop top pair, we're, we're not gonna get sucked out on as often. And um, you know we actually have the wheel potential there. And this is gonna be a pretty easy call. I don't know what, why players play with only eight big blinds, but. Now, I mean, you can't let these little small losses put you on tilt. Um, you know, okay, so you lost a pot and had eight big blinds. Uh, it's really not that big a deal, and I'll tell you why. Like, think about it this way. If you were going to lose that hand no matter what um, for that many chips, like even if he had probably like four to big blinds there, I'm probably still calling preflop with the queens. Um, we're going to raise up the... Posted dead, so I didn't notice. I didn't. I didn't tell you guys that. So he did post dead, from what I remember. He should have posted dead. All right. Uh, unknown player. This is, these aren't the stats for this player. Um, what do you guys think is going to be the correct play here? I'm gonna go ahead and, and put time down right now. But um, he started with four big blinds and we isolated him, and then he goes has an, and leads monster pot here. Um, I believe the correct play. Uh, we we really can't call here 
and we've got, you know, if we're behind, we're gonna have like the nine, ten, and the jack are all gonna be outs for us. So we're looking at like um, how many outs, like twelve outs, or something like that. Oh, I, I did a count, no, three, six, ten outs. Um, so we're roughly like forty percent equity. Plus, he's gonna fold, like he just did there. So we have um, fold equity in that spot too. So when we're called, we're still like forty percent equity, and when we're behind, um, I'm sorry, and when we're behind, we're gonna have forty percent equity when we're called, and he's gonna fold heck of a lot too. So um, I'll let you guys go ahead and do the math on that if you guys want to figure out the EV of that spot. I know I have a couple of students of mine that would probably be willing if I let them. All right, um, I guess we're just gonna go ahead and get this in. You know, hopefully our opponent has a hand like 6-7 or a set or something like that. Um, I gotta put them all in, right? Yeah. Okay. That, I mean... I don't know... He probably should have re-raised pre-flop with his ace-king suited and get me out of the hand. Um, his flop lead was pretty good. But... Playing that turn is gonna be pretty hard. Like, if he's gonna be betting that turn, he probably should be... But folding it, maybe? Forty big. I don't. I don't really play forty big blind stacks uh, myself. I guess if I had to stand up against forty big blind stack, I might just check fold it on the turn. As you know, we don't have that much invested in, in the pot. Um, I might check call once and then check fold the turn. All right, this guy is an extremely tight player. Uh, against these tight players, you call pocket pairs a lot preflop. If I see bet here, he's gonna be folding everything that that uh, I beat. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, give him a little bit of a rope to maybe look me up here with kind of like, I'm going to bet like, uh, I don't know, 80 cents, something ridiculously small. I don't think this guy's going to be bluffing me at all. And if anything, he's going to try and look me up with like any pair. And if he raises me, it's going to be a very standard center full. This guy's so tight pre-flop, he's calling me almost exclusively with pairs. Um, uh, you could argue that my small bet here is going to induce a raise as a bluff, and it is possible that that will happen. Um, I just don't expect it to. I could check again and get a free card, and you know, if I were 100% confident in my read, I would most certainly do that at times, especially if I have a large enough sample on something to know that they won't be calling. Like they have a pocket pair there every time, and they're not going to be calling a bet. Then I will check that again. But some players will still call me there with hand like nines and tens after I check the after I check the flop. All right, both of these are very standard check spots. Um, I'm not a big fan of betting like the queens on an ace high board or representing the ace when we don't have it. It's not a very good. It's not a really good way to get value. Um, he bets like two thirds, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're not gonna be folding to the one bet and uh, the board pairs on both. And that's actually an improvement to both of our hands. If he goes ahead and bets here again, I probably will be more willing to call another bet. And that pretty much is going to lock our hand in. And we're going to make a little bit of a value bet here. Uh, I don't expect him to fold a jack. If he shoves me all in, seriously, I will fold. I mean... He, he's going to be calling my bet here a whole lot with a check. He's going to have a hard time folding it, as well as he might be value betting it there on the turn. Um, now the min raise, we didn't exactly go over what happens if he min raises us. Like, what's the percent chance, how often is he actually going to have the boat here compared to our own hand, and how often is he going to be racing us with the jack? Um, you know, we're getting like 4 to 100 money, so we need to be at 20% of the time. Um, I think that there's at least a small percent chance that he he will be min-raising us with a jack here, just because he might be kind of stupid. Um, when he doesn't min-raise it with the jack, I'm actually going to expect him to have the quads. But I'll call here, just for uh, funds. Yeah, he actually had the, the quads, which is extremely unlikely for him to have, because there's only one ace up in the deck. Like if he were to go all in, I probably would fold. So his min raise on the river was kind of was kind of kind of gross. I mean, I I don't think I could really check to him 
because I think he's gonna check back a lot of his a lot of his marginal pairs that he might be bluffing with that he might call. Um, I think I made too small of a raise here. I was too focused on the other hand. I should have made that a dollar, and I didn't even see what happened up here with the queen jack hand. How I got involved. That's what happens when you're playing a lot of tables and you're trying to talk at the same time. But I mean, his you know he calls a lot of hand three flops, so he could have anything you know like nineteen percent. His flop betting range and turn betting range, yes, it's going to actually have an ace in it a whole lot of the time. But once like the third ace comes out, it, it really skews his line towards hands that like don't have an ace. Um, just because there's only like, one ace combination out there, and there's a jack, and I have the two queens, and so like a lot of his calling combinations pre flop are going to be like ace jack, ace queen, and like ace, and ace king. And there's really not that many combinations of each of those out there. There is going to be a small percent chance that he will be raising me with, like, uh, King Jack or something like that. Thinking that he can get value out of it. And, you know, he might do that. I really have no idea if he's going to do that or not. If he's if he's remotely has any kind of fishiness in him, then, then yeah, I might uh, feel that way. But, you know, we run, we run boat and we run boat of queen or aces full of queens on a on a, ooh, this guy's pretty bad this guy's bad too hmm. I'm gonna fold for now uh, you know we run full house aces full of queens when like there's three aces on the board and two uh, quad aces it's so unlikely that it actually ever happens so I don't actually have a problem with paying him off there I don't think I could fold to the min race. Now you could question whether or not the river bet was was too large. It might have been too large. Maybe like a four dollar bet would be more likely to get a jack to call me, or maybe even a jack to raise. Because I made it like what six into eight. I think I did. He, I mean, he 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 bet pretty small to entice me along to come in, but. To be honest, we got kind of we got kind of cooler there. We just ran really bad. We're gonna be blind selling these two guys with like any two cards. This guy here has played one hand. This guy here played two. So But you know what I mean? Like we fold the turn if the second ace doesn't hit, and to be honest, we might even fold the river if like the third ace doesn't hit either. So I mean we ran we ran pretty bad for that, for the events to occur as they did in that situation. For us to pay off. And we didn't even lose our stack too. Or even like double somebody else up. Alright, we're getting like ten to one here with ten seven offsuit. This probably doesn't have that much equity to it. It's probably gonna be a break even call, so I'm gonna go ahead and call it. I mean it, it can't be too minus E V, but because we're getting ten to one in our money just to make the call. And for like 5% to hit two pair, so we don't need to make too much money post flop to hit two pair. Um, 10 10, we don't have any read on him really, but A 10 offsuit's pretty too strong to really fold against a blind steal. Especially against someone as myself who's opening so much on the button. Um, this isn't really a great flop to, uh, to for us to steal at given our hand. Uh, maybe if we had the ace of spades, I could see myself doing that, but. There's going to be times where we will have to fold like ace high here and the thing you have to tell yourself is you know you really shouldn't try and win every single pot. You know, if the board doesn't come good for you then don't try anything. Now we could go for a check raise here. Maybe if we had a gut shot, I would probably check raise bluff. Um, but when you you know when you start doing bluffs when you have no equity post flop, it's especially in full ring, you you get yourself into a lot of trouble. And it's usually better to just go ahead and fold and look for um, spots where you're going to have more plus CV to make a move. You know, this isn't a tournament where you know, you're going to have limited opportunities to play against fish. You know, there's going to be fish all over the place. I kind of want to cold call this five six suited, but I I won't. So, uh, so much, so often players just try and sit there and try and win every single pot possible, and it's what that's going to do is just force. It's going to make you play pretty poorly. It's going to make you make minus EV plays. Like, yeah, a check raise there might be okay, but given the fact that I have like no read on him and I've got no equity when called, um, 
It's not even that. It's not great that I'll play it. Now, if I had maybe a couple over cards, um, you know, ace king there on the queen high board, it might be a little bit of a better play. Still not saying that it would be all that great, but at least then with the like ace king, when we actually hit our ace or king, we might actually we have we have a better chance of winning it than when we have a hand like just one over card there. So uh, the key the key to a lot of bluffs is your equity when called. And the second part of good of good bluffing is you know your opponent's hand range get certain given flops and and uh, if you don't want to get rebluffed then you also got to make sure that like your range fits in well on that on that board too. Um, on a board like queen seven three monotone like what am I exactly check raising in there other than like a set in the majority of cases so that's what you got to think yourself too. Like yeah well he's not going to call me without a queen but. You know what the heck am I possibly re representing there other than um, the nuts, you know, or draw? And the problem is that's just there's just not enough hands in my range there to, to actually think about that I actually could have a hand there because I'm probably going to be re-raising queens preflop. So I'm representing only like seven seven and three three. And to be honest, I'm I'm probably not going to be calling three three preflop. So I'm representing like one possible hand in those pocket sevens, and that's just not a good way to go around trying to get bluffs. You want to have value, and you want to be able to represent whatever it is you're trying to represent. Otherwise, you're just gonna make it look like you are bluffing. And when you when you do have a bluff, that's one thing you don't want to do is make it look like you're bluffing. Hopefully, I explained that pretty well. This guy here seems actually pretty aggressive, so I still like my call with the Ace Ten preflop, even in hindsight. One thing that I uh, want to harp on is to continue to blind steal, and don't be afraid to do it with you know pretty wide cards. As I'm doing here with Jack Eight Student, these players can certainly play back at you enough, so it makes your raise like in the spot where you have a hand with any kind of decent equity, you know, profitable to fold. Against these two guys on here to my left on table four. Uh, the 5-5 five, five and the 5-4, I'm going to be raising their blinds to any two cards because seriously they're folding 95% of the time. Let's go ahead and isolate this guy at Tan Tan the boss. I've uh, seen him open lump a heck of a lot of times and uh, we're going to go ahead and play pot with him. Now if I have, if I have some free time I'll go over my HUD once more as I do it a lot. And, well, we're going to see what this board... Well, we actually, if we hit an 8 or a 10, we're actually going to be feeling pretty good about our hand. We're going to bet somewhere around a little under 3 quarters of the pot. We could... Two, this is actually a decent hand for us at 2 barrel. Um, it changes a lot of things kind of puts the scare card out there. This is actually going to be pretty marginal. What the heck is he check raising me with here? He must have like ace four or like the nuts or something like that. I guess because I'm actually really representing the, the ace. Unless he, he, there's a good chance that he called me with ace high out of position and you know so be that. So I'm going to go ahead and fold that ahead now. It's a really good two barreling card to be honest. I'm going to check back my ace again. This guy here has so many hands. I don't think I'm going to be folding this turn if he bets. Uh, I'm going to be betting mainly to build the pot so when I do hit the flush, I can get my stack in um, and give myself that opportunity to. There's also a really good chance that I'm going to be a B ahead because he's going to call me with hands like A7, um, you know, in gut shots and stuff, and I'm going to check it back. Or 6 7. I mean, he wasn't folding that on the flop regardless, and he wasn't going to fold it on the turn. And I realized to myself that, like, once I check behind the flop, that, like, I'm not going to get a pair to fold the turn. But I don't expect a pair to fold, even on the flop, so, like, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I give myself just a heck of a lot more equity there. Um, and 20% of the time, like, there's going to be uh, a flush coming in, and, you know, another, you know, 12% of the time, I'm going to improve to the king race. So, roughly, like, one in three times, I'm going to be improving to a hand I'm going to be willing to stack off with. So I wanted to build a pot enough that I can actually 
be able to put my second on the river when I do hit my hand. And and also, I, there actually could be a value about there because he's going to be calling me with worse worth worse aces. And let's go ahead and let's little put a little bet out there. He's going to be calling me with worse aces. He's going to be calling me with oh, worth flush. I'm not not worth aces. Worth worse flush draws, worse open end straight draws, and so there is some value to that bet too. Now that said, I don't think we've hit like an ace or king with ace king yet when we've played it, so we're not actually running all that great. But we will survive. And we're, these are going to be two very easy races up here, number two and number three. We're very aggro on these tables. Uh, I'm still debating whether or not I like my two barrel with the uh, my garbage. I was as I was just talking about not you know bluffing a lot without without any equity, and that's like a perfect spot where we have like no equity. And after we um, see about the flop, um, if it was a complete brick on that turn. There's probably a likelihood that I would just give it up because the board doesn't change, and um, you really can't lump in together um, two barrel bluffing and like check raise bluffing because they're two completely different beasts. A lot of players will just call the flop to fold to the turn um, with the scare card as big as that ace was. Like he's either gonna really really hate it or he's already decided he's gonna go on anyway. Or that he's not going to fold. So I do believe that that ace there is going to hit my, you know, the hands that I would see with that flop with that I missed. What percentage of them are actually going to have an ace in there, ace in them, you know? And to be to be honest, if I actually had a made hand there, I probably wouldn't bet it and then fold to raise. Like I'd either check it back, or I would bet it and be planning to call the all in. Um, also, if I had like a backdoor flusher there, I probably would check it back on the turn. Only because I didn't want to, I wouldn't want to have to deal with a check raise and just take my free equity, I'll take my free card. So I guess it's a good thing that I don't have to run the greatest in all my videos. It makes it feel like you know I I don't run such a ridiculous high win rate, but. And I deal, you know, I have the same situ difficult situations everybody else does. You no, know, not everything is going to be 100% uh, standard for me every 100% of the time. So keep that in mind too, while you guys get get yourselves involved in difficult situations uh, post flop. You know, don't feel too bad that you get them. It's just that when you do get them, you know, you learn from them, or you know, you and you try and you try and solve them at the present time. Think about like what you did in the past, and you know what has worked for you, and You'd be surprised at how well that works. Uh, you know, its own intuition. Salomon seems to like to min raise pre flop. Something that I've noticed a lot, and this whole min min button uh, all the way around. So when he deviates from that min raise, I uh, might have to take note of it. But if he min raises here, I probably will call him and try and play a pot out of position or play a pot in position with him, if only for the sake of the video. But I still think it's going to be profitable. A lot of times I like to call in position with some of these hands, and let's see, he's really tight again, so uh, he's only going to be calling my flop bet with an ace or like hand like king queen. I have just zero bout value in betting my queen right now. There is even less value in betting line queen right now because the, the jack comes in. Although, alright, there might be some value here if he calls me with king jack or jack ten or something. That's the spot where I'll check back that flop a heck of a lot. You know, I'm I'm really afraid of the king, and even then, like I'm not that afraid of the king. He min re raised here, so like, I guess he's used to limit hold him. And I would have liked to have seen this flop too if it went three way. 
and I'll check that. I'll check that queen behind so much just because there's zero value in betting. What is he gonna call us with on an ace queen next board that queen ten beats? You know, especially someone who's only like ten five and now he's twelve five. His he's calling so tight preflop that uh, we can't hope to be getting any value from him when we actually hit our hand. Now when we check behind and we look weaker. Like like I said previously, when we check behind, we're not gonna get fold. We're not gonna fold out any pair, um, or at least any like um, third pair. That we, like if he had like pocket twos or something, then he's still gonna fold. But any reasonable, uh, any kind of reasonable Broadway pair with a gut shot or something that like King Jack or Jack Ten, probably won't let it go, especially if I make it small enough. Depending on how the action goes here, number one, I will raise this up sometimes. Um, against fish, who are open limping a wide range, I will most certainly do so, and as I'll do it for value, as well as because I'll be able to take it down post flop. I find that if you know why you raise, you'll be better at why you do what you do. A uh, queen off suit. I think my opponent's opening so much on the button here that I'm going to call again. If this were at 200, I might re-raise this as it makes it easier to play. It also depends on how good my opponent's post-flop play is. The better they play post-flop, the more I'm going to want to re-raise pre-flop. Um, that's kind of like how the edge skill goes. Since I've got, I think I've got a significant skill on them, then I'm going to go ahead and, and be able to play a smaller pot of position here profitable. Now again, this board did not hit us very hard, and if we were to re -raise, check raise here, we would most certainly never do it with a hand like worse than like ace jack. So keep that in mind when you're going to be doing that check raise there. And so when we do check raise there, and it's like, what the hell can you possibly have? It would be like, well, you know, I'm representing pocket jacks, I guess. You know, so you're just not representing a really wide range. Now that is a spot where I did have two overcards, but not really much else in that regard. Like, I didn't even have a backdoor flush draw, so uh, you know it's not exactly the uh, the greatest situation. Now maybe if I had like the king of clubs to go with it, or maybe if the board was like jack nine five. Um, I'm also gonna be able to lot. I'm I'm gonna be able to have some suiting connectors. And the gut shot really helps. The amount of equity. A gut shot and overcards, you have a lot of equity there. One of these days I might check raise bluff for you guys. But to be honest, it's not necessary, in my opinion, to 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 do it at this at this limit. Now I'm not saying you should never do it, as I'm always looking for spots to to make to make a plus E V play. But uh, to just go ahead and just flat out and guess and do it just because you think it's going to be okay when most likely it's not going to be then you know we're playing full ring so it's certainly okay to tell yourself that it's okay to fold because it's full ring uh, yeah we're not going to be hitting the flop all too much with a hand like king queen when we're calling out a position like that like what like one and three uh, but we're getting two to one odds pre-flop to make the call so we don't necessarily have to hit all too much, um, and when we do hit, we're going to be able to, to play our hand for a profit, because we're going to hit like the top pair, good kicker most of the time, and we're going to trap a hand like queen jack and queen ten for value, and king jack if the king comes. All right, this is our first premium hand of the session, if I remember correctly. Come on, let's get action. Let's put this a buck. I've worked really hard for the last 50 minutes to get you this king's hand, and I'm totally under raised this again. I'm having a really hard time seeing the uh, the bet size against with these stats and the stack sizes and stuff. So I apologize again. This is supposed to be a dollar and a quarter preflop, not a dollar. Totally miscalculated that raise size, but we will survive and live on. Very good flop for us. Um, 
Obviously, if we get raised here, we might have a little bit of a, a problem. We're pot committed against Pokier Manis, Manibus, or whatever his name is. We're going to go ahead and isolate this guy up here. Um, there's just too much money in the pot compared to his stack size. Greg Stadler is kind of stationy, so I'm going to be kind of wary if he does raise me. All right. And this guy's got like three times the size of the pot, and so that means an SPR of three. Um, we're just gonna fold our nine to the re-raise. So SPR of three. Now, if you if you've read Professional No Limit Hold'em, you'll know that um, it's gonna be okay to stack off here against. In in this situation, now, it's hard for me to go into specifics with only 12 seconds on the time bank. So I'm going to go ahead and make the fairly standard call here. And not necessarily double fist pump, but probably a fist pump and look at, you know, he's got fours here. So One reason why that makes that call as profitable as it is, because, uh, okay, I'm going to do my best to explain what uh, the author's explanation was for that book. And I highly recommend that book if you're having trouble, like, planning hands and knowing when to stack off, when not to stack off. Okay, so let's go ahead and look back at this hand here for a second. So, our opponent has $10 and the pot's 3, so let's just say the SPR is 3. Um, stack to pot ratio is simply just the amount of money we have in the infective stack divided by the pot. Um, you use these situations, and if this guy bets, we're going to be re-raising him and get it in, getting it in. It gets a short stack with ace-jack, and that would be fairly standard. Um, when, when you calculate stack to pot ratio as uh, what's the pot say dollar seventy five let's make it two uh, stack to pot ratio uh, in a nutshell okay and now we're getting ourselves in some trouble now if Lord Otz comes in and shoves we m might have to let it go although. Okay, well, we have the Jack High Flush draw and a couple overcards, so we're going to try and get this thing heads up with the Lord Ots. I mean, as long as Syra folds, we're going to be okay. If he doesn't fold, now we're going to be in a really bad situation. Now, we don't actually mind if Lord Ots comes in and makes my hand a lot easier to play. Oh, man, we are in a situation now. There's no value in all in betting um, with the hand that we do have. So we're going to at least try to uh, do something here. I don't really know. Well, we're this is kind of too small for us to fold right now. But I don't ha really have any idea what he would be calling that flop with and betting the turn that, like, wouldn't be some kind of for value. Yeah. Okay, so he's just a donk. That's a pretty really tough situation, though. Yeah, it's just a bad player. And we've got ourselves another situation down on uh, table four as, okay, not anymore, but if we did on that, if we did a bet again, we'd have, a, we'd have ourselves a pretty tough situation. Sorry, there's just so many hands going on right now. I will probably be stacking off with these aces in this pot. Um... What's the chances that he actually hit this king as compared to, you know, just uh, trying to bluff the missed flush draw again? It's a really good, good it's a question to ask yourself, but given that we check to him and try to induce, we got to hope that he's going to be bluffing here sometimes. But he had us the whole way. And uh, we're calling him in bet to try and show it down. So there's just so much going on here in this last uh, 
45 seconds or so that I'm going to go ahead and uncheck my blinds and we can go over everything that just happened. Okay. So where do you want to start? Um, we played the king's hand against the fours. Okay. So that table is going to be fine. The next hand that I'm going to go over... Okay, we have an ace. Eh. I'm going to go ahead and see about here and try and get a, a full lot of them. Usually I have like King Queen a heck of a lot, and King Jack, and all those kind of hands that didn't hit this board. So I think the C bet's gonna be profitable. His raise here is extremely bluffy. Uh, he's representing basically nothing right now, uh, but that's what happens when you play against really tight bad players like this. Like he's 11-4, so like he doesn't probably know that he's representing nothing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and fold it. I mean, historically, it's a really bad spot to raise as a bluff. Um, now, I'm not going to be re-bluffing him because he's just so tight. And, to be honest, like, I know my c is going to be profitable. I know that my raise preflop is going to be profitable, that I'm just going to make it. I shouldn't have auto-checked there. I was going to raise as a blind steal. All right, so we have a, we had a hand up here. We had Queen Jack. Um, did we have Queen Jack or did we have. Well, we had Ace Queen, okay. Um, he, limped the, he limped the small blind, and so we went ahead and raised it pre flop, and then we didn't see with the flop. As you can see, we've done that a lot uh, today. We have not been see putting like, good Ace highs in position, been taking our free card, and we got to the river with only costing us another quarter. Um, so, I think he will fold sometimes on the flop if we make the c-bet, but it's probably because he's going to be folding the hand that we already beat. Um, Alright, we're going to keep raising it up. Okay, and we're not going to be folding to a minute on the turn. We're getting such good odds. And on the river, he goes ahead and pots it, and it's like, whatever, you know. He can go ahead and have the pot then. He's so tight that it's just very unlikely for us to be ahead at that point. We're going to be subbing this ace high in position. The difference between us having this ace high as compared to uh, another ace high is that our kicker is extremely poor. And we are trying to get worse aces to fold. Hey, look at that. we got a subbing to work. Uh, to be honest, guys, that's like the difference between like running well and and running bad is when, you know, you go like 0 for 5 on sea bets when you miss, and you go you go 0 for 5 on sea bets when you hit. You know, no one calls you when you hit, and everyone calls you when you miss. So that's pretty much running bad. There, we got one to work out. Uh, and then we had most importantly, we had our pocket aces hand up here. I'm going to go ahead and finish, Okay, which was six hands ago already. Told you, full tilt deals hands very quickly. Alright, so we had pocket aces. And our opponent was, at that time, pretty aggressive, if I remember correctly. Uh, we didn't really have exactly too much of a read on him, other than like 30-30. But on a queen high board with two spades and a re-raised pot, like he's gonna be calling me preflop with a hand like ace queen. He's gonna have kings. He might even have like king queen, or you know, depending on how bad he is, he could have a flux draw there. In a re-raised pot, the pot's five, and we've got an effective stack of whatever my stack was at the time of uh, 33 minus 250. So. We're looking at like an SPR of around six, right? And against an unknown and a re-raised pot uh, on such a dry board as this, you'd almost have to put your opponent specifically on pocket queens in order for us to not get it in here. And so if our opponent has queens and kings, he's going to have kings two 
times as much as he's going to have pocket queens. Uh, yeah, you could th if you throw in, like, you might have, like, fours and threes with the queens and the kings, then, you know, we're kind of tipping it in that direction, but if he's going to have fours and threes here, he's also going to have, like, ace queen. Um, and he's going to have uh, flush draw a lot, too. So, uh, that said, I'm going to go ahead and go finish over that last hand and I'm probably going to go ahead and sit out here. But I hope you guys have enjoyed the video. Let me go ahead and pause it real quick and we can show how much I've won or lost. Alright, and we're back. And as you can see here, we've... Uh, some of these hands were played before we before we started, but, you know, we did pretty well. 18-14 uh, is, is actually pretty loose for us, but, you know, we blind stole a heck of a lot. And we won a fair share of pots. So... That's been said, guys. This has been Code Red Rules coming to you live from Full Tilt Poker. And uh, good luck at the tables.